When we were young, we read more often because we had to. It was the only way for us to get knowledge and to be enlightened. Read to your heart's delight and be enlightened. Let's just read. It's a podcast by Andy's Personal Development. Stay tuned for more reading and enlightenment. Okay, so we welcome you live on Let's Just Read. And on the top left-hand corner there, we have a video that is supposed to be playing. An introduction. Um... But we're going to leave this out for a moment. And we just want to have our our guest, Mark Connor, be the one that's really been the highlight of this entire broadcast. So stand by. Let me just get this right. And there you go. So I'm just going to introduce our guest for the moment. Let me just tell you a bit about him and the work that he's been doing. He writes fiction, poetry, and journalism. He is the 2022 boxing inductee to the Mancini's St. Paul's, St. Paul Sports Hall of Fame. He attended the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul Regis University in Denver, Colorado, and graduated with a BA in English from the University of Minnesota. He has written and published many articles about boxing, Irish culture, and people and events related to Irish freedom. He has also published local news and features on business, politics, and current affairs in Minnesota and the U.S. It's about time. Millions of copies sold for that is a saga wrapped around a package of poems guarded by angels with a narrative style that reads like a novel, contains a collection of poetry, and shares an autobiography. Mark Connor guides us through a journey of love, family, and life that is ours as much as his own. Wow. That's a, an amazing and wonderful uh, repertoire of his introduction that we have there. So welcome, Mark Connor. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Danny. Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful to have you, my friend. And so this episode is entitled The Legacy of Mark Connor." We'd love to hear directly from you. You are the star, the feature one of the moment. Tell us about your life in about two minutes, how you came to realize and recognize your ability as a boxer and what brought you all the way to where you are now. So much more into journalism and writing and that amazing book you wrote with about It's About time tell us a bit about that starting from the time that you realize you should be in boxing oh the time i realized i should be in boxing um i was uh nine years old i started really thinking about being a boxer i'd actually thought somewhat about writing prior to that to say third grade um um, uh, fourth grade i i'd seen the movie star wars many times and i thought thought the idea of writing this you know story something like that and um um when i was when i was a kid but then uh you know that that movie uh rocky came out and i i thought it looked kind of stupid i didn't want to see it and uh, uh my brother really wanted to see it we didn't see it but then my parents uh we went one one saturday to go see rocky two the second one and i always thought if i saw the first one i don't know if i would have wanted to become a boxer because i was inspired by watching him actually win the title he didn't win the, he didn't win the first one but um, all, at the time, also, boxing was becoming pretty popular uh, in the U.S. It was uh, shortly after the 70s. So it was like the late 70s, 79, um, 1980. The uh, U.S. is really thriving in uh, amateur boxing. It was on TV all the time. And I had this kind of real, you know, this kind of desire to be recognized and to be um, – you know, to, 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 to have some kind of a attention and I wanted to be athletic and I kind of, I, I, I 
I actually was thinking I wanted to be a bodybuilder at that time, but then I, I was watching the guys boxing and I could see the aesthetic beauty of the, uh, the how muscular they were and everything. And the, the whole rhythm of uh, the sport and everything really just attracted me. And uh, so I used to, I started begging my parents to take me to a boxing gym. My mom didn't want me to. I kept begging and begging my dad. He finally took me to a gym. And uh, so that's when I started boxing. And I started really, I could always write pretty well. But then when I was, when I was 16 years old, I had a uh, assignment in uh, school to write a descriptive piece. And I wrote a descriptive, descriptive piece about uh, going to and being at the gym. At the time, I had, when I was 14, I'd made the National Junior Olympics. My coach trusted me enough to give me a key to the gym. And I was describing going there uh, and uh, uh, actually going there before everyone else and opening the, the equipment locker and everything and the smells and all that kind of stuff. And my uh, teacher actually, he was telling my class about, you know, how we'd done very well and everything when he was giving us the evaluation. And uh, he, he read it uh, he read it out loud to the class. He read a portion of my of my uh, work, which he hadn't said our names, but people knew it was me. And yeah. was, that was that time I started thinking, maybe I could be a writer, maybe I could do something academically also. And I know I'm going over two minutes, but the last thing I'll say about that, was I brought it to my father. I remember him sitting on his chair um, before uh, before I was going to turn it in the next day and hadn't read it. And he would just smile and say, you know, you always could write. You're always a great writer. You're always really good. And I, and, you know, I always knew you, you know, I kept saying to myself, 16 years old, when did you ever tell me that? You never remember telling me uh, that. But, but, he, yeah. but he told me he told me that at that time. And it's one of those things about life, about my dad, that, I, you know, I, one of those beautiful moments that I always remember, you know, that stay with me forever. Yeah. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing, Mark. I could hear the passion in your voice coming down to the end there, especially when you speak about your dad. When you actually got into boxing, what was the transition period like for you based on the level of training that you had to do and, and, and the suppression of any emotions when you go into the ring and you face an opponent, you just had to put all your feelings aside and focus on the moment. How was that experience like for you? I'm sure many would be interested to know. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I remember uh, the, the first fight I had, I was 10 years old. It was a 65-pound weight division. And, um, yeah. Um, it was January of 1980, and I remember, I can remember the name of the guy I boxed. His name was Chris Ness, uh -huh. last name spelled N-E-S-S, -S. and um, um, and I won the fight. It was very close. I probably won the fight because um, it was in St. Paul, and he was from uh, a town called Litchfield and kind of kind of west of uh, the, the Twin Cities, and um, um, it was close enough that, you know, probably the fact that I had local uh judges helped me a little bit but yeah. um i i definitely i definitely think i deserved the, the the win but i remember praying before it and saying, saying you know i know that you know to, uh, telling god but you know i want to both of us be safe but i want you know i want to just please i just want to want to win this i just want to i want to do this it's just so badly and you know nobody in school thought that i was could be a boxer i was always kind of smaller skinnier kid and you know uh -huh. the, the girls and the girls are usually were mostly bigger than i was you know and stuff like that so so uh and i didn't get pushed around that much but i did get pushed around a little bit i was a little timid and everything and you know i won that first fight and the thing is once you get into the uh to the drama of it you're just you're just doing what you've been practicing and uh, the, the, the coach I had, Emmett Yanez of the Mexican-American Boxing Club, God rest his soul, man. He was a, he was such a wonderful guy. He, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, he just, he, he just trained me in a way that he just kept that focus every day and everything. And that was the coolest thing about it was it's something that, you know, kids, when they, when you get, you, you get home from school, you go ride your bike, you go hang on, you do all this kind of playing. My way of playing was I was down at the boxing gym. I'd go through the routine of this, you know, stretch, shadow box, hit the heavy bag, hit the, you know, jump rope, you know, hit the pads, hit the, you know, spar, whatever you do for that day. And you do it every day. And so you get so, you get so much practice at it that it becomes one of those things that it's not that you're not thinking, but it doesn't, you're, you're not uh, consciously having to 
tell yourself to remember these things anymore, you know, and you're just, you're just doing it. So that's kind of, uh, yeah. you know, you get kind of a command of a, of a skill. So it's like, okay, I'm going to do it now, you know, right. even though you are nervous, you are, you do have some fear, you know? Yeah, I get that. I understand that. So let's just focus on the book for a moment. Okay. And how did you come to the conclusion that, you should write this book and why did you choose the name that you choose for the publication okay um so it's it's about time millions of copies yeah, so yeah 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 okay so uh so um i just my father i actually have a a, a section in here where i actually um explained that i'd had this uh this kind of ended up in an argument with my dad in my mm -hmm. adulthood, in my adulthood, because he's saying to me, you know, you've always uh, claimed to be a writer. And, uh, and I was, pub I was publishing, you know, articles and stuff like that, but I'd never uh, published, uh, uh, I'd never published uh, a book. And he's saying to me, why don't you, why don't you get a book published? You know, and, and I was actually, uh, I was actually trying to get revised a novel I've been working on forever. And he was saying, you know, why don't you just get something, put it out there, let it go and move on to the next thing. And so once he, when he was dying, I'm, I'm looking at him, I'm looking at him in the hospital when he's dying. And, uh, you know, I've got my rosary. I've, I'm rubbing on him. I'm crying. I, I, leave, I leave, leave my mom in prayers. And I'm just saying to myself, you know, he never saw me publish a book. And just like, wow. what am I doing? What am I, what am I doing with my life? I've procrastinated yeah. so much of it. I mean, I've done a lot of things. I've had an interesting life. And I think that um, it's explained. There, there are very interesting things I talk about that I've done. And they're worthwhile things I've done. I talk about in the book. But this was supposed to be something that I was supposed to be doing. And it's part of what's supposed to be in a, uh, I'm supposed to identify myself with. And I want people to think, think of me and remember me as, having done and I haven't done it and he hasn't seen me do it, you know, I mean, and, and I, it was, it was that. And also I very much was regretting not having been married and have had children before he died. Uh. It's, it's, uh, uh, so that's, you know, I mean, in the, in the description of the book, it talks about the book being about love, family and life. And those yeah. are values of mine. And, and, uh, and that's why it's quite a bit of this faith based, um, I actually have, uh, uh, I, I was, there, there's this section, I think that would explain it really well, um, about, uh, what the story I was, uh, just telling you, but I'm, I'm not finding it immediately. So, um, maybe we could just go on, but I, I, yeah, not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, so that's that's how I came to the question is how was I did I come to to writing the book and also how did I come to the title was it yeah how did yeah. you name it it's about time right and millions of copies sold for that for that yeah so the thing was yes. so I there's there there are two people I had read the book right away one of them is Dan Flynn who uh, I list in the acknowledgments as my um, uh, literary literary advisor. And he, he published a book called Famous Minnesotans. Um, and uh, he's, he's, the, uh, he's the older brother of the now deceased, uh, well-known spy novelist, uh, uh, Vince Flynn. Um, and then um, this other guy is Dan, Danny Klecko, who I mentioned in the book early on, yes. um, um, who is a, a St. Paul poet. And I, I, Dan, Danny, when he was looking at it, he was saying, yeah, I really like it. I really think we can market this and everything. But you got to lose the title because it's about time. It's too esoteric, and there are a lot of books out there that are called "It's About Time." He says mm -hmm. you got to call it something else. And I originally had just put in parentheses my essay of poems, but that just it looks, doesn't quite specify things well enough either because it's not a collection of poetry and it's not just a long essay. It's really a story that's sort of written in a novelistic form, and mm -hmm. it's got these. It's it's it's, it's it's got these poems running through it. So I just, I said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to put in parentheses millions of copies sold for dad because yeah. 
it's a, it's it's an amphiboly, which mm -hmm. is a logical fallacy. It's got it's got it's a, a statement you make that means one thing, but it could also contextually mean something else. And yeah. it's about time I finally got a book published. It's about time I actually did this, and it's and and Dad should have seen it. And it's about time. Hey man, it's about time to sell a lot of them too. I mean, it's it's either way. <laughs> and and if that doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But if it does, hey, that's great. You know. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a wonderful story, Mark. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna. Are you seeing the book on the screen there? The cover. I am. Yes. Yeah. How did you come up with the artwork, Mark? It's it's amazing. Okay, I've seen so, that time glass in the middle, and yeah, yeah. Well, if you actually look closely at that, there are actually uh -huh. there are actually four uh, hourglasses in there. Right. If you, look, right. if you look at the hills down there, the, um, that's a horizontal yeah. hourglass. There's one yeah. up uh, on the upper left on the cover where the sand's coming into the right. big hourglass. And then if you look at the medicine wheel with the the boxing glove imagery and all the shamrock and that. Yeah. Um, yes. Up on the upper left, there, there's this kind of a, a you can see a hourglass wow. kind of on the side there. Wow, and wow, wow. The, uh, the guy who did that is named Eric Keast. Um, he's uh, he's in Canada. He uh, got me my job at Honda Young, our home center in uh, 1996. I met him. He was, he was working there. And uh, that's a Native American Indian uh, homeless shelter for kids age 5 to 17. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. That's quite a bit about what my my journey is and what my my uh, explanation of of uh, my my uh, my solidification of my faith is. I mean, I was I was involved with the American, American Indian community here locally and uh, explored that spiritual uh, uh, tra tradition, sp specifically the Lakota tradition. Um, and uh, within that, within that that circle, there was a mutual respect with uh, the people practicing their traditional uh, uh, beliefs, along with um, with 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 me as a Catholic. And within the uh, ex experience of of being immersed in that community somehow what happened and i just would say this is kind of the uh the guidance of the angels and the just the the uh connection to the holy spirit is just somehow my i ended up re-embracing my catholic faith um, all right and so i still have this i have this real respect for what what we call the red road and i see mm -hmm. i see is is that there is a uh that there is a spiritual value there there's a spiritual truth there um and there's uh and i recognize it but i also recognize as a as a christian that this is um this is what i this is actually who i am it's okay. it's uh yeah so wow but, yeah but so so anyway so that's eric keese that that uh painted that painting that's on the cover he um i called him up and said you know you I know for this cover, I'm going to have to get you to do it. So, so that's what happened. Mm. All right. And who is this guy? Oh, that's uh, <laughs> that's Bert, God rest his soul. That's Bert Sugar. Um, ah. Bert Sugar was the most famous. Um, he's, I would say, in our lifetime, was probably the most famous or one of the most famous uh, boxing journalists. Uh, okay. In in the world and. I, I was that's that's 2010. I was at yeah. uh, Gleason's gym in Brooklyn, and there was a there was a uh, press conference that Oscar De La Hoya was doing, and that's where I mm -hmm. met him. But I but I but I actually had met him before that in 2005 uh -huh. uh, at the in, in Las Vegas. I think it was me. I was just I just found the the ticket. I, I'd gotten a free ticket, um, um, a comp ticket. Because I I was supposed to get in the uh, uh, the locker rooms with uh, Will Grigsby, my teammate, who was regaining at age 35 the uh, IBF Junior Flyweight Championship of the World on the undercard of Felix Trinidad and um, Winky Wright at the MGM Grand Garden Arena, but um, 
uh, he had given away his last uh, braces to get back there. So uh, when when they couldn't get me back to the locker room with him before the fights, um, Dennis Presley, our, our mutual trainer, said, wait, we'll go figure this, this stuff out. And he comes back 45 minutes later. He says, Don King's daughter got this uh, printed up for you. And it was, it was a $450 ticket, which at the time was $50, $50 <laughs> more a month than my rent. And it was still on the upper level. But uh, – <laughs> I had come down when they after Will had regained the title and to try to get back towards the locker room. Big George Foreman had just walked by me and I was I was gonna go up, hey, you say hi to Big George. And as I as I start to do it, four blonde haired women about in their in mid 40s just oh George, George just grabbed him and said they so and just wanted to talk to him. So <laughs> that's my experience with George Foreman. But then yeah. um um I, I was people were gathered around trying to get back there to the press conference. And I saw Bert Sugar there, and I talked to him, and I said, hey, you know, I I started talking to him and just having this conversation and everything. And I remembered uh, when he, he he stepped away then we uh, to talk to someone else. Then when he was he was going walking by me, we, we parted. He, he shook my hand again and said, thanks, good meeting you, Mark. And as I really was impressed that he, he remembered my name. And uh, I talked to him at, uh, at that press conference at um, Gleason's. And uh, we had a – I was asking him about the cigar he smoked. He says, uh, uh, well, we joked around about it and then I, 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 I won't go into the, the, to the whole thing. Um, but uh, it was just just really incredible experience. So anyway, it's, it's uh, cool that you ask about him because if you look at him, he's got the, the perfect kind of character that you find in the yeah. boxing, boxing yeah. world. He does. he does. He and does. He does. He's a really great guy, yeah. Yeah, and wonderful. Excellent journalist. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. So, uh, Mark, when you look at the literary giants of the world in terms of not just sports journalism, but writing mm -hmm. on the whole, who would you say would have the most influence on you and your style of writing, if any at all? You know, my favorite writer. Is F. Scott Fitzgerald? That's mm. that's my that's my absolute favorite. I've actually read The Great Gatsby probably thirteen times. Um, I've I've gotten kind of out of in in the last five plus years. I've gotten out of the uh, uh, rhythm where I can do this, but I used to every September um, because it reminded me of my senior year of high school and um, in in the fall semester the only advanced placement uh, class I ever had, my AP English class, um, we read uh, The Great Gatsby. And uh, I believe it's the perfect, I believe it's just the perfectly written uh, uh, story. And what is so perfect about it is if you look at the first, have you read it, by the way? Or? I have never read it, but I okay, know what well, you're speaking I, about. I, I even saw, I think I saw the movie. Yeah, well, which you know, which version did you see though? Which movie did you see? Which, uh, did you... It was the Great Gatsby, one of these is, great actors. I just can't remember. Is, is it I... one, yes, with Leonardo DiCaprio? Uh no, the one before that. Okay, with uh, uh, was Robert, it Grant? Red, Robert Redford. Robert Redford. That that yeah. would have been the guy. That would have been the guy. Yeah. Now I, I I saw the very end of of that one time on TV, but I never and it looked like it was probably done pretty well. But um, um, this last one uh, with with uh, uh, DiCaprio. DiCaprio is a good mm -hmm. actor, and he I thought he did a, a it was it was he did a good job. But I thought that the uh, production was terrible, and they 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 screwed up the story because they, they right uh. in the beginning, right in the beginning they they have uh, the main. The uh, the narrator Nick Carraway, uh, he's finishing the story from an insane asylum where he's recovering from alcoholism. He's he's one of the two characters in the entire novel that you can of the main characters that you would say is definitely not an alcoholic. So I I, I just you, you can't mess with literary stories like that with the the actual with the actual story like that because you you, mm -hmm. you 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 end up. Uh, you know, you end up screwing up the entire uh, purpose of the story. But what I love about Gatsby is that it's so balanced. Everything that happens those first few pages, you see yeah. at the end exactly what happened. 
And so it's, it's, it's a very short and to the point novel. And um, um, so, so I, what I'd like to say about my book in relation to that is uh, certainly I can't, can't compare myself to them like that at all, but there, <laughs> but there are things that, 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 that I say in the beginning of the book that come down at the, at the, at the end of the book, they're, they're mentioned again in very in in some specific ways, but some but very just to the point ways where it they're they're brought back to memory, and it's it gives you full circle of what the story is and and what happened in life, and that's that's uh, that's what I aim for when I try to tell a story. Um, yeah, the Fist World's my favorite, but there are, there are others too. You know, I mean, okay, uh, but. Uh, you know, we probably don't have enough time to go into everyone. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting. That's really interesting. It, it shows me the dimensions of the character that you are, and it's quite admirable. So, tell us a bit about Fighting Chance Boxing for Life. Uh, well, that is. So that's just my my personal training service. So, so when I mm -hmm. started, that's one thing that my dad uh, told me to do. He says, you know, you're going to start uh making some money just to, by by teaching people boxing so i do work with actual competitive boxers but i also the main way of uh, uh surviving for the way most trainers do it is um you get you know the white collar guys and stuff like that or the people that just they want to be in shape and they got a little bit of money they could pay you and everything mm -hmm. he said to me well then you better register a business name and okay. start doing it and is it a sole proprietorship and so i just came up with that name being fighting chance because if you're you know these these people that just want to be in shape and live their lives longer um i'm teaching them to be in shape and to uh be healthy i'm also teaching them the fighting skill at the same time and uh you know you're not gonna you're, you're not learning to be able to just beat up people if uh they mess with you but if you're getting mugged you might have a chance to hit them once and run you know what i mean i mean you would just just a your little chance to survive and I think that that little edge you give yourself from um, the dedication of doing these things that are a little bit harder every day, but you know, a little bit fun too. Those things help you get through everything else in life. You know, it's one of the things. It's one of the gifts that God has given us. You know. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 Um, I did find the. Uh, uh, the section in the book. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. yeah it's, on, it's on page thirteen. So I, I just. Um, um, well, I just finished this this poem. Uh, let me read the poem, and I'll read the uh, the very short uh, narration that comes after, and so people can get yeah. have an idea of how the mm -hmm. the poems. Then you got these narrations that come with it. So um, this was a, a poem called "Life So Simple." So I wrote Sunday, March 31, 2019, and I signed it JMJ, which uh, uh, that means Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And yeah, I, tried, okay. I started putting that next to my to my, to my title. <laughs> okay, okay, it, cool. As if to pray, you start today in meditation on your bicycle wheel, the separate spokes united in the center. You want me to be blunt, you say. I want to be direct, but fear I'll frighten you away. The final action is the original intention. This statement is authentically true, not just my invention. My responsibility is to you a comfort for my rest, a respect in my behavior, helping you to be your best. You can push me away, invite me to stay or walk with me today, but we met for a reason, to teach each other and learn. Such a fact comes not from acts, but is a grace we did not earn. Demons distract, demons lie, and demons discourage us from our destiny till we die. Friends encourage, friends assist, and friends persist with love on which we rely. Your guardian angel already talked to mine. Together, they have watched us share laughter and argue to the point of crime. Hmm. You know they're sent by God who really does exist and is not a tyrant or a terrorist. Rather, he is love, family, life held in common at the core you and i specific spokes united in the center spinning round 
from place to place and nothing more. Wow. There were some other poems I put together qualifying for appropriate inclusion in this book. I've always held myself, of course, to the highest of standards, never believing any of these poems ready for an attempt at publication. So I never tried, which is why I so embarrassingly titled the story, It's About Time. Mm -hmm. Dad challenged me once, as far back, I believe, as 2012, asking me why by the age of 40 I hadn't published at least one book. If I really was a writer, as I asserted myself to be, I should have been able to publish at least five novels or other books by then. I told him to lay off, that there were legitimate reasons for current incompletion and that literary success was on its way. But that was all an excuse. Mm. The real reason was a lie in my heart that my work was going to be great. I just needed time to concentrate, which is always delayed right now for the job or the friend in trouble or another excuse which justified not trying. The truth is I was scared, so I never dared. If this book, which can fall flat in its face, is never presented to the public, I'll never know if you, the reader, recognize my talent. If it does, in fact, fall flat in its face, at least metaphorically, I fall flat on mine. However, so what? It's about time. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great stuff, Mark. Wonderful so, stuff. So, so um, I, yeah, go ahead. So uh, go to boxersandwritersmagazine.com slash books, and you can get it there. You can get it. It's going to be on Lulu. It's going to be on uh, Amazon. You can get it by Lulu, Amazon, or Kindle. All three are right there. And uh, if you're in yeah. St. Paul, you can get it at Irish on Grand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just going to help you by putting some stuff on the screen there so that folks oh, can know. So and if you have a question or comment for Mark, you can do so in the chat while he's still here with us. We just have a few minutes to go before he moves on and we end the stream. Here's the thing. I'm going to leave that up there for a moment. I, I cannot end the stream without asking you, in, in your honest opinion, who you consider to be the most technically sound boxer that you have ever seen and i know oh. you've seen many oh that's extremely difficult to say ah. my favorite so 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 okay so in you know people i mean contemporary is different than than uh than old know, school right right and old school is to me is uh is newer school to than it is to to people today um but right. uh my favorite boxer of all time is alexis arguello uh, you know, you know who i'm know talking him. about right, yes so i know him definitely right right lightweight champion i mean he was junior featherweight featherweight and i mean his featherweight junior lightweight and lightweight champion and then he lost his two attempts to win the uh uh the junior welterweight championship from aaron Pryor. He was incredible. I loved him, and I loved. I I just I loved his technical, uh, uh, his technical abilities. But you know, Roberto Duran, incredible. Mm -hmm. Hands of stone. Then, then, yeah, yeah. Then you look at Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, so maybe I honestly a good a good possibility would be someone like Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson. Right? Yeah, because he, yeah. he was he yeah. was incredible. Um, you know, now you know, uh. And people have people's bodies are structured differently. That's what the last so so um, the last trainer I had, Dennis Presley, uh, God rest his soul. They're all I'm, they're all dying now. Um, he uh, he always talked to me about about your body structure, your body mechanics. So Manny Pacquiao was really 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 great. Yes, he lost at the time of his career that he fought. Floyd Mayweather Jr., um, he lost. And there were certain circumstances that made it harder for him to fight him at that point in time. I think maybe he could have beaten him if he fought him four years earlier. But then again, we can't say. Floyd Mayweather mm -hmm. Jr. is incredible. I don't believe he's yeah. the same. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, so, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's hard to say. But, I mean, the guys that I like, I, li I, li I like – 
I like Roberto Duran better than I do Mayweather. I, I don't like his style as much as these other guys. Um, but uh, Duran, it was, you know, I, it is hard to say, man. It's just, it's, I, I, it's, it's one of those things. It's just like jazz. Look, the, the first poem in here is, you know, the perfect metaphor. And the, the, the first line is the perfect metaphor to describe boxing as jazz. And yeah. it's because you have that improv, you have the reg, the rhythm that's going because all the whole is about who, who, who is going to, um, uh, I don't know if we got enough time. I'd read you the poem, but I don't think we got enough time. Um, I'm going to give you an extra minute. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so the perfect metaphor, uh, written Monday, August 21, 2017, JMJ. The perfect metaphor to describe boxing is jazz. There is a rhythm mm. to every fight. I learned this from Dennis Presley, who learned it from Rock White. A fighter has a rhythm, and the only way to beat him is for you to break it and establish your own. That's where improvisation begins. No one knows where it will lead or where it will end. Yeah. Jazz is the perfect metaphor to describe boxing. Every fight has its rhythm, upon which is added improvisation. I learned that from Dennis Presley, who learned it from Rock White. We practice collaboration with Emmett Yanez and Bobby Zamora, the two men talking yeah. to fight. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so we have been in the presence of Mark Connor, and he's a legend in his own right, not just from a, a boxing perspective, but also a literary and a journalistic perspective. And that's his information there in case you need to get him, make contact with him, or you need to get his book. It's about time. Just remember that. It's about time. And you've heard him recite two poems as well. And he spoke lovingly about his dad and how much he wanted to do this publication just in memory and in dedication to the legacy of his dad. So we're out of time now and we're going to end this stream. We thank you for your continued commitment and your support to Let's Just Read, our sister podcast. Remember to continue reading so that you can be enlightened and receive knowledge and information. Until next time, this is Andy of Andy's Personal Development on Let's Just Read together with my guest, Mark Connor. We are saying so long. Godspeed. God bless. Bye for now. Until next time. Mm -hmm.